Good afternoon. Welcome to today's City Council meeting. Before the City Council begins our formal meeting, we will convene the Verdin Community Facilities District Board of Directors. I'd now like to call to order the February 7th Verdin Community Facilities District Board of Directors meeting. Will the clerk call the roll? Board Member Ansari. Here. Board Member Guardado. Here. Board Member Hodge Washington. Here. Board Member O'Brien. Here. Board Member Pastor. Here. Board Member Robinson. Here. Board Member Waring. Here. Vice Chair Stark. Here. Chairwoman Gallego. Here. Is there a motion to adopt the Verdin Community Facilities District Resolution? I move to approve the adoption of resolution number B-02, calling for an election with respect to the issuance of bonds by the district and the levy of an ad valorem property tax attributable to the operation and maintenance expenses of the district. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. The meeting is now adjourned. We will invite Fire Captain Troy Holtorf to provide an invocation before today's formal meeting. Our Father in heaven, all glory and honor to you. We stand here in awe for who you are, a God of action. Thank you for what you do, what you did, and what you will do for us, your people. You are an awesome God. Lord, before we meet and talk with one another in this meeting, our desire is to meet and talk with you. Teach us the way, Father. Help us to follow. We ask that of you now, Lord. May your will be done. And we ask for a blessing on today's agenda. May it be your agenda. Lord, you are good and you are in control. May our hearts remain anchored between these two mountains of truth. And like the old hymn puts it, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. When darkness veils his lovely face, we rest on your unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, our anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. It's in the cornerstone of Jesus Christ that we pray all this. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge... We'll now call to order the February 7th formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council. Will the clerk call the roll? Councilwoman Ansari. Here. Councilwoman Guardado. Here. Councilwoman Hodge Washington. Here. Councilwoman O'Brien. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilman Robinson. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Vice Mayor Stark. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Mario Barajas and Elsie El Duarte are with us. Would you please introduce yourselves for the audience? Yes, Mayor, thank you. As you've already said, my name is Mario Guarajas, and together with my colleague, Elsie Duarte, we'll be serving as today's Spanish interpreters for our uh, formal city council meeting. I'll now take a moment to introduce ourselves to our Spanish-speaking audience. Hola, buenas tardes. Yo soy Mario Barajas y junto con mi colega Elsie Duarte estaremos sirviéndoles hoy como intérpretes a los de habla hispana. Deseamos pedirles de antemano, si es que van a dar un comentario público, por favor hable despacio, con claridad y evite tener distracciones de fondo. Finalmente, pause después de cada una o dos oraciones para que podamos interpretarles lo que estén diciendo de la manera más completa posible. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mayor. 
Thank you so much. Would the city attorney please explain the role of public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Members of the public may speak for up to two minutes to comment on agenda items. Comments must be related to the agenda item and the action being considered by the council. General comments that go beyond the scope of the agenda item must be made in the citizen comment session at the end of the agenda. The city council and staff cannot discuss or comment on matters related to pending investigations, claims, or litigation. Additionally, any member of the public who appears before council in their capacity as a lobbyist must, as required by Phoenix City Code, disclose this fact before addressing council. The city code requires speakers to present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language, threats, or personal attacks on members of the public, council members, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules will, can, will lose the opportunity to continue to speak. Thank you so much. Would the city clerk read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G7172, 7221 through 7232, S50530 through 50575, and resolutions 22182 through 22183. Items 1 through 2 are meeting minutes. Councilwoman Pastor, do you have a motion on item 1? I move item 1. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Councilman Park Stark, do you have a uh, Vice Mayor Stark? Do you have a motion on item two? Yes, I move to approve item two. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Item number three is boards and commissions. Vice Mayor. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve Mayor and City Council boards and commission nominations. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, we have an exciting swearing-in ceremony today, including for a member of our Women's Commission who serves uh, at the Consulate General Office of Mexico in Phoenix, and we are very pleased to be joined by the representative of the Mexican government in Phoenix, Jorge Mendoza Yescas, our, our wonderful Consul General, as well as many members of his team. So uh, please join me now in swearing in these commissioners and welcoming them And uh, Maria, thank you so much for your service. Uh, I state your name. So, I, Maria. I, Maria Fernanda Arreguin Gámez. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. That I will support the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the Office of Women's Commission. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Welcome to our Women's Commission. Thank Congratulations and welcome, Maria. We next move to the liquor license portion of our agenda. We provide an advisory role to the state of Arizona on liquor licenses. Vice Mayor, do you have a motion? Yes, I move to approve items 4 through 15. Second. Any comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Passes unanimously. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business, planning, and zoning? Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes. I move to approve items 16 through 90, except the following. Items 21, 25, 26, 29, 36, 47, 77, 78, 88, 89, 90. Item 41 is continued to March 6, 2024. Item 81 is continued to March 6, 2024, and excluding these additional items for virtual public comment, and that would be item 48. And can the clerk confirm if there are any other items that should be excluded for in-person public comment? Yes, Mayor and Vice Mayor. Also excluding items 24, 28, 40, and 62. That's 24, 28, 40, and 62. Thank you, so moved. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Roll call. Ansari? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 21 is mobile training solutions. Do we have a motion? I move to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Councilman Waring. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so a year or so ago, constituents called. Uh, they like to go to our parks, and they were disappointed to see that plants had been killed. They said it was pesticide related. I was a little skeptical about that. And I have to admit, the company or whoever fessed up. So. Uh, they sprayed the wrong plants and they killed a bunch of nice flowers. So I do appreciate us doing this, but, but please make sure they get good training because it takes a lot to buy and plant plants. We don't want to kill the ones that people actually go to parks to see. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 24 is additional resources for the finance and street departments to move procurement and engineering processes more quickly. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. We have Leslie Shepard to speak to the council. $500,000 is the amount we're working with here for this speedy efficiency. The GEO bond passed with only 17% of voters turnout. And that's who you're supposed to be representing as the voters. Only 17% actually turned out for that. Just because a small fraction of the voters turned in their ballots to vote for the bonds to be issued does not mean that the bonds need to, need to or should be issued. They actually don't have to be issued at all. Furthermore, do not use this money to implement road diets. Road diets put small businesses out of business. I don't know about you guys, but I just came from across the street at the Board of Supervisors. It was like, you know, it was shocking how much maneuvering we had to do. I had a friend with a scooter because he can't walk. And I'm telling you, just to get over here across the street was maneuvering. I can't imagine if we keep doing this throughout because we've got these little things going on throughout our city and we think it's really, really important. It can be, but I'm not so sure. When I look over on Madison and I see all the homeless and I see all this money going toward this, I have to go, wow, I don't think we're putting it into people, especially when we're trying to eliminate people's ability to drive and have to ride bikes. Number one, it increases cr crashes. Number two, it uh, causes serious injuries. Like I said, he even had a scooter. It got caught in the little uh, trolley thing for the, uh, the bus rail. Um, it um, causes more pollution, more than you realize, and that completely is opposite of what this is supposed to be out. These policies do not generate the results 
Phoenix res residents want to see. Every time I'm going to get up here and I'm hearing about money, some of you guys, I really do appreciate you. I've seen things that you're doing, and I appreciate it. I do. I don't care what your party is. I do not care. What I care about is we've got homeless over here on Madison, and we've got big dollars going for projects that need to, we need to complete the projects we have first, and let's deal with these homeless people. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Waring. Yes. Stark. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 25 is a public hearing for the proposed 19th Avenue and Parkview Lane annexation. I will open the public hearing. We do not have anyone here to comment. I will close the public hearing. No vo vote is required at this time. Item 26 is a public hearing for the proposed annexation at 19th Avenue and Happy Valley Road. I will open the public hearing. We do not have anyone here to provide comment. We'll close the public hearing. No vote is required at this point on that time, at this item today. Item 28 is related to the purchase of trees. Do we have a motion? I move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Leslie. I guess I'm trying to understand. So the motion and the second was for what? To pass the motion? Is that what it is? Yes. Because you're motioning and you're making a second before you even hear the public. So it's almost like in vain. This is six million taxpayer dollars. Number 29, which ties in with it, that's eight million taxpayer dollars. That's important information to be considering when you're doing this. I don't know about anyone in this, in this room, but I think we're all pretty um, hurting right now for finances. I can't say it enough. We've got homeless living on Madison, and I guarantee you the baby trees that you're going to be buying with this money, it's not going to give them any shade. So I'm just asking you to consider that a lot of this frivolous spending right now, these are little bitty trees which cost a lot of money to get them where they need to be. And we're overlooking the fact that we have a homeless population that is growing at exponential rates. And we're passing this kind of money. I love trees. I love being outdoors. But I guarantee you I love people more. So I'm asking you guys to quit passing these things that cost us so much money. It does not benefit people. It is not going to be providing shade for anyone that's homeless right now. And so I'm asking you to please stop passing things right now that cost so much money when we have a horrendous homeless problem. So 28 and 29, I'm going to combine the boys, both saying because they're both dealing with buying millions of dollars worth of little tiny trees, and we've got a major, major homeless problem. I do believe that there needs to be porta potties all around this building until the homeless population situation goes away because you guys are spending our money and the homeless are still out there on the street. Thank you. Councilwoman Hunter Washington. Can I ask um, the Office of Heat Response, or I can just ask this question, maybe Gina can answer it as well. It applies to 28 and 29. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, just want to ask a couple of questions based on the commentary heard from the public regarding this. Um, can you identify the source? Well, one, the source of the funding for this is the ARPA funds, correct? Uh, thank you, Councilwoman, for the question, Mayor and, and Councilwoman. Uh, no new funding is requested associated with these items. Approximately one third of the spending that, uh, sorry, approximately one half of the spending that we are asking authorization for is from grant funding that the city has already received. One third of which is the American Rescue Plan Act funding that you have already allocated, and two thirds of which is forthcoming money from the U.S. Forest Service through the Inflation Reduction Act. We're also requesting authorization for unanticipated future grant money that may come our way. And just to, to clarify, those funds of the grant money that we've received have been, are specifically for this purpose. It's not funds that the city can reallocate to another use of their own choosing, correct? Councilwoman, that is correct. Thank you, Mayor. 
Thank you. I'm looking forward to supporting this item. We hear all of from throughout our city about the need for more trees in our community. We've seen research showing that when our corridors where we plant a lot of trees, it can make as much of a 10 degree difference in terms of summer heat temperatures. And I think this is a great partnership with the federal government. I very much appreciate them working to make sure we move this forward. Um, for those of you who support our tree program, we also have a, a portal where if you would like to purchase or donate money towards trees at, to celebrate an important milestone, uh, we can partner with you. So our local Sikh community donated 550 trees to support the 550th anniversary of one of their important leaders, T. Jen, donated 70 trees to celebrate the 70th birthday of one of their most accomplished cancer researchers. This is a real opportunity for our community to come together. Council, Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you, Mayor. I um, also want to thank the Office of Heat Response and Mitigation. I think our this program is, is vital. The district I represent includes um, big parts of South Phoenix, Maryville, West Phoenix, and the Tolleson area. And there are very um, uh, data-focused tree equity scores out there that demonstrate that those particular areas of Phoenix are very much left behind when it comes to equitable access to trees and shade. And, and as the mayor said, it makes a big difference not only for heat, but also for improving air quality. And so um, I just want to, to thank you because we've seen a lot of success in areas where we have built the cool corridors in Levine. Um, this Saturday, I will be joining at um, the Hyde Park neighborhood for a tree planting. And what's especially um, notable about this program is that we've been able to plant trees at schools, in neighborhoods. Uh, we did uh, the MC Cash area a couple months ago in District 7 where um, we knocked doors for many weeks to talk to residents who um, lived in the area and we actually worked with them and many wanted to see more trees in their neighborhoods and so then we went out and planted these trees in partnership with a great nonprofit called Trees Matter. So um, I think uh, I'm very grateful that we still have some ARPA funding that we are able to spend on this and also grateful for all of the private sector partners who have stepped up to support uh, these continued efforts. So very, very exciting. I do think this is a very important component of making sure we uh, right the wrongs of the past when it comes to inequity in our city. Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, as well, just want to say thank you for all of the hard work. I know this past Saturday we were out in Maryvale and we planted trees in front of people's homes and people were very excited to see all the trees that we were able to plant I, um, on the corridor on 55th Avenue. We've also planted many trees and just seeing the families being able to come come outside and go out and walk and take and take their dogs for a walk and be out there children out there with their scooters and being able to get back outdoors i think um, it's incredibly important even though i do agree that we have an issue um, with hom homelessness i know we have another item on the agenda where we're also going to be talking about that um, so i know as a city we're trying to do everything that we can to tackle all of these crises that that are happening um, but yes i would invite anyone to come out to Maryvale when it's 120 degrees, go to Maryvale, and then go to a different place where we have enough trees, and, and, and I think people will be able to see the difference. But thank, thanks so much um, for the Office of Heat and all the hard work that you guys are doing, and um, definitely supporting this item. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We actually have a delegation visiting our city right now that the Nature Conservancy brought, individuals from as far away as Toronto, and they are touring our trees. Um, or they have already done so with our chief heat officer, um, including looking at the bridal path and some of the beautiful areas in Phoenix, as well as some of the areas where we are partnering to do more. If you know an educator, we have a wonderful Shade for Schools program, and we would encourage schools that would like to have more trees on their campus to partner with us. And our, our resident educator, Laura Pastor, is very involved with those programs. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. So the recent item was buying the trees. Item 29 is taking care of them. Do we have a motion on item 29? I move to, I move to approve item 29. Second. We have a motion and a second. Councilman Waring, I think you have a question on this. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I did. Uh, sort of a statement, but just an encouragement. 
Uh, I've been really happy with the tree program. Uh, some of the trees are a couple years old now. They're really coming in nicely. But I have called in I don't know how many dead trees as well. Um, sometimes they're just dormant or whatever, but you know, there's definitely been some that you've had to go out and replace as well. I know this was really an important project to Thelda Williams, uh, and, and I agreed with her at the time. It's also about beautification. We're having trouble getting enough people to clean our streets. I can tell you having those trees out there definitely makes a difference in how the city presents itself, frankly. So I'm, I'm pleased to see them. There's a lot of trees, and that's all good. We have to make sure we take care of them. That was the problem last time in District th uh, 2 and District 3, because I, I drive across a lot of District 3, just in my normal routine for work. Um, you know, there are a lot of big trees that were city-owned that we just let die. And I don't want to replicate that. So all I would ask is that we really do a good job of taking care of the trees. Don't plant them too close to corners. We just moved one. I mean, because that drives me nuts. A resident complained, and I'm sure he was probably right. When the tree grew in, it was probably going to block views when you try to make left turns. I see plenty of what I assume are city-planted plants that make it tougher for people to make a turn. So let's try to avoid that and make sure that those trees are maintained because as the speaker said earlier, this isn't cheap. If we're gonna do it, we need to do it right. And frankly, to honor former Mayor Williams' memory too, because I think this was really her thing. Um, just please do that. So thank you, I appreciate it. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 36 is additional funding for Central Arizona Shelter Services. Do we have a motion? I move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. This is one of many items we have today related to housing and homelessness. We have previously approved funding on today's agenda for partners such as UMOM, and we are agendized to vote on 271 units of housing today. Uh, we have several council members with comments on this item. We'll begin with Councilwoman Pastor, followed by Councilwoman Hodge Washington. Thank you, Mayor. I am just making comments on the fact that uh, this item is to adjust for inflation and to continue to provide emergency shelter services, which is desperately needed. And uh, I do support this item in particular for the inflation because we have not moved, uh, as inflation has risen, we have not moved the dollar amount uh, in order to serve. So I support this item. In the future, what I would like to see is uh, when an item comes back like this, uh, possibly the projections of the future of inflation so that then we know what to do as, as it hits or place it within that contract so that then you don't have to keep coming back for additional dollars. And Mayor, Thank you. if I may, Councilwoman Pastor, to that point, that's what we've instructed Budget and Research and the Human Services Department to do as it pertains to these particular contracts. Thank you. Councilwoman Hunt Washington. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm also in general support of this of this um, request, but my concerns go a little further than what we are currently dealing with right now. Um, it's my understanding that the CAS or Keys is facing a shortfall, and I wanted to talk. I wanted a couple questions. I had a couple questions on uh, on that. I don't know if you're the best person to ask for that, or okay, I see Rachel come in. I'll wait till she gets down here. Mayor, Councilman Hodge Washington, as Rachel comes up, we will um, do our best to answer, and I know that we have representatives from CAS also in the audience if there's detail that we may not have at this moment. And if they're represented from CAS, I would actually invite them to come to the, to the table if possible as well. Thank you. Um, so some of my questions, I just want to make sure we all in, at the table understand the, 
the circumstances that are currently faced in CAS or Keys, I'm sorry, I keep calling you CAS. Uh, no, this one's CAS. Okay, Council CAS. Is that Keys yet? Okay. Yeah. The Human Services Campus is now the key, okay, sorry. key campus. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. With this, if uh, I want to understand what is the projected shortfall that you are facing for this fiscal year? Yes, please. It's 1.5 million this fiscal year. Okay. And is of that 1.5, how much is attributable to the adult shelter that we see at that our would, downtown? That would be 633,000. And do we have an idea of how we intend to, because, well, yes, if this shortfall is not uh, made up, what are the steps that, what are some of the consequences that we, the city of Phoenix, might see as a result? Yes, and if I may, I would like to address the family shelter as well, and also why we're facing a shortfall, but at the adult shelter specifically, and our board chair is here, because our board did meet to discuss those consequences, um, one would be, we would reduce the 24-7 services. When we scaled up to 600 beds, we were very lean in our budget. We've always been lean, and we did 24-7 services as well as client empowerment programs. So that, that's uh, some background on that. So cutting case management, the four case managers plus client advocates would reduce our staffing. Um, that's one thing we would have to do within about the next 60 days. The 24-7 services would allow us to save a shift, which would mean those 600 to 650 people would not be staying in all day. They would leave for six to eight hours a day, which is how we used to do things. And there's some other things, facilities and things we would cut. Um, can I ask, I, I know that inquiry has probably been made to the City of Phoenix as well. Have we made additional inquiry or similar inquiries to other jurisdictions to increase their potential allocation to help meet that funding shortfall? That's not for me, is it? Or I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, I don't know that we have specifically talked to any other municipalities in the last few days, but we had put in um, three grant requests to the State Department of Housing, um, hoping that we were going to get some of the 40 million that was just awarded in the last, um, really in the last two weeks or so. So we had been fairly confident that we would get at least some of that money. We ended up not getting any. There was, I think, 275 million in requests for 40 million in grants. So we were, you know, we were among the 235 million in, you know, good projects that did not get any funding. So we honestly have been scrambling since then, and that was literally week before last, to go to any and every source, private, um, public, anywhere that we can go in order to try to find additional money to help. Oh, so. Councilwoman, if I may add to what Bill Moreland said, the specific amounts, um, I think he may have sent those to you, what we applied for to the housing, shel or the, not housing, the homeless shelter fund, which was a total of 60 million, 20 million to municipalities, nonprofits participated in the six, second 40 million, but there were 275 million in request. We did apply for 30 months of funding for the adult shelter at 3.6 million. We applied for 1.6 million for the family shelter where we have a deficit of 435,000. We applied for 2.7 million for the senior haven which you all have supported with capital support and which is moving forward and we've secured the operating dollars we need to get that open as well. We have um, almost every municipality supports us. We had sent a letter back in October that lays that out. We get several 100,000 from Glendale, from Mesa to support our downtown shelter. Nearly every municipality supports the shelter. Phoenix's funding is um, very appreciative, appreciated, but we do not rely solely on it because it's critical that the region really share in that. So we do have a lot of requests out. And I appreciate that. And my comments were not meant to suggest that you are relying solely on the city of Phoenix. My question was more so by identifying this shortfall the same way that I received some information. I was wondering if the, about the request. I was wondering if other municipalities have also been made aware of this request and the implicit ask of uh, increasing the amount of funding that's being allocated to uh, or being sent to your direction. What's the purpose of my question? 
Oh, is that a yes? Is that also the question? Well, because what I heard is I heard yes. that so we're okay. Go ahead. Our partners say in Glendale, they're aware we did not get the homeless shelter fund, but they do give us a, a very um, a significant allocation to the downtown shelter already. So they they work with us on that. We have not done specific solicitations to the other cities, but those um, grants are in the process. So we always do that. If they have discretionary support, that's a next step in our strategy too. So we're working on that as well. So we continue to have diverse resources coming in to support the adult shelter and the family shelter as well. And if I understand your comments correctly, you indicated um, you're currently primarily in this situation because the funding that you anticipated from the state did not come through. Is that correct? That is a factor, but we also have seen um, a surge in costs. We've had a 56% increase in security costs since 2019. And specifically, when we scaled up to 600 beds and now we're serving 650, that number went very high. We've had a 600% surge in some of the shared operating costs on the key campus, and that is also adding to it. So along with um, funding, it's also been increased costs. Um, we've always run lean. We're running super lean right now. I know that's not your question, but it, being fiscally responsible is important to us. It's those increased costs. Um, our chief operating officer here, Philip Scharf, at our board meeting presented, we have facilities cost with 600 to 650 people in the tens of thousands, how many times we were calling the plumber out every week, because when we had a lower number, we didn't have those costs. So those are added costs. That's not inflationary costs. Those are real hard costs from having scaled up and um, not receiving the funding. We, we wouldn't be here if we had had that uh, support from the state, but there was huge competition and you know a lot of worthy projects. Okay. I can add one thing. We yes. have discussed at the board and we have every intention of going out to, again, private funders, private fundraising, foundations, and other municipalities. We were spending about the last week since this all came up really concentrating on Phoenix and also making sure we knew what kinds of questions would be asked by council, figuring that those would also be the kinds of things other municipalities, other agencies, the county would want to know. So, um, you know, now that we've kind of gotten through that week of conversations with some people, we know, um, you know, how to sharpen the message and give people the information that they're really going to want, as opposed to blanketing them with, we're desperate, please help, which was kind of where we were a week ago. Um, and then just a couple of final questions. Um, mentioned, um, I wanted to understand how, what percentage of the operating or the income for the, not income, but the um, revenue for the operation of the shelter comes from private donations versus government. And yeah. how do we generally allocate that? Yes, our overall budget last year um, combined was 69.1% government funding, 30.9% private. So our adult shelter budget, our family shelter budget, have very little admin. Private, a lot of the private dollars support the admin. Um, our housing programs, we raise private dollars. So uh, we raise a lot of private money to augment the public services. On a $12 million budget last year, that was close to $4 million in private dollars that we raised. On top of that, we had a capital campaign for the Haven. We've raised almost $4 million for that in private dollars. And the government funding we've secured has, has made up the other $18 million we've raised so far. And as I, one of my last questions is, how do you, is there any way that you can partner with the organizations that are already on the campus to help address some of the shared costs that the, uh, you're experiencing? I, I, we um, absolutely will continue to try to leverage resources to be as lean as possible. Uh, Bill and I had a lunch talking about just that thing. Um, the costs on the campus have gone up tremendously because they're serving more people when their costs go up our costs go up too in terms of security. The fact is there are hundreds more people who are off the streets being served at the campus and at CAS. So we're all kind of facing a similar scenario. 
but um, this lunch we had, we were talking about how do we together advocate for more funding at the legislature. The homeless shelter, 60 million, it's a one-time fund. We need ongoing support from our state. You know, fortunately, that fund happened and is helping the cities, helping a lot of the nonprofits. So we'll continue to lobby like we always do for more of those resources. And Philip has conversations also with partners on the campus. How can we get leaner on security, share some of those resources? So there are certainly conversations. Um, and lastly, I promise last one for you, is understanding the time frame given where we're, given what we, if the status quo remains, you're not able to get additional funds, when do you see um, having to make the decisions on whether or not to cut additional beds? The board voted to um, give it 60 days, and so that was January 30th, that meeting. Because um, we, we, it's, we don't want to do that. Um, and it's a 60-day window if we can't secure and bridge the gap. Appreciate, uh, those are my questions for you. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions. Um, I just would want to um, encourage on our end from the city perspective is that we look into how, um, if there is, for, if we're not able to bridge that gap, what would be the city's response and how do we plan accordingly for, um, for the additional changes. I, I think we all can sit here and agree that we, we pride ourselves in, what, in cleaning up the area around the zone, making sure we were able to serve more of our unsheltered population, and it would be a disservice for us to have to, to walk that back and not be able to provide services in the scope that we have before. So thank you again for answering my questions, and my comments are in support of this inflationary um, adjustment to the contract that you provide and the service you provide to the city, but I want to make sure that we are looking forward to make sure that we are not... Um, we're not, we're not taking steps backward, that we're moving forward in a manner that makes sense for not only our, not from the city, but for the residents and the, and, and the population that you serve. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to thank uh, Lisa and Cass for laying out exactly what's at stake, thanks to the questions. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with those final comments. We, um, you know, we're rightfully celebrating the success of what was formerly known as the zone, but that we've also asked you all um, and every shelter provider and service provider we have in the city to step up to make sure that we can house more people. And I really do want to ensure that we don't take any steps back. So um, I just want to indicate my support to make sure that Phoenix does everything we can to meet your shortfall that you have. And, and I'm very grateful for the work that you all do. Um, I also did have a conversation last week with um, Amy Schwabenlender from, from Keys uh, to Change. And I do think there's a much bigger conversation that the cities and service providers and the state need to have about what is going to happen when ARPA funding does end. This is, I think, a, a looming crisis that um, you know we all are aware of, but maybe the public is not as aware of. And we've been able to do amazing things thanks to American Rescue Plan dollars. Um, we would not have been able to build a thousand shelter beds over the last two years and have 800 more coming online if it wasn't for ARPA, but those dollars are running out and I'm very concerned about what that means for the future of addressing homelessness and, and so many other amazing programs that our city has been able to, to start. And so um, sort of, this is more sort of a call I do think we need to convene around this issue and, and hopefully whether it's the state and also the federal government um, recognizing that addressing homelessness is a national crisis. Um, hopefully we can look forward to more dollars um, federally as well to tackle this issue. Thanks. We'll go next to our city manager. And then to Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, members of Council, Councilwoman Hodge Washington and Councilwoman Ansari, um, you've, you've raised some really good points and I couldn't have teed it up any better myself. As you know, for the past couple of months, we've been going through regular and reoccurring exercises to reallocate our ARPA funds to ensure that we maximize those dollars and to ensure that we spend those dollars where they're intended to be spent by priority. And so we will be coming back to you on February 21st. I've had an extensive series of meetings with, with Gina, Rachel, and team, as well as my budget and research department. And I think as we explained last time we did our reallocation, there is no probably greater priority for those ARPA dollars than our unsheltered population at this point in time. So we'll continue to make that a priority. Um, so when I come back on February 21st, my, my 
anticipation is that whatever funds we have available will be prioritized amongst the unsheltered services that we've stood up. The other thing, as you know, we are in the process of forecasting our status for 24-25, and we continue to work on our long-term projections for 25-26 through 27-28. We have been also working with uh, the Office of Homeless Solutions and Gina and her team to try to really understand what those ongoing costs are for those services that we've stood up over the past two and a half years. And the intent is that we are going to try to our best to leverage our ARPA dollars to minimize the impact on the general fund in the, in the short term. In the long term, trying to understand how we could you know, prioritize those dollars in the general fund as we move forward. So I will have more information for you when I come back on February 21st with the, with the ARPA reallocation, which will be a formal agenda ask. And then when we come back the following week with our multi-year forecast, we will have additional information in that report as well as in our presentation in terms of what we anticipate our ongoing homeless services costs to be. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. And we've tried to be very strategic with American Rescue Plan dollars and put as much as possible towards capital projects, knowing that this was one-time money, so trying to invest in, in capital. But obviously, as you see here today, operations is as expensive as well. Um, when we, um, and for those of you who don't follow the council often, American Rescue Plan dollars were dollars that Congress and the Biden administration gave to us to help address the impacts of the downturn and COVID-19. We were unanimous in saying that housing and homelessness was priority number one and have been allocating resources in that area. And sometimes we got to step in and, and fill gaps from other branches of government as well. So a uh, question related to that. Um, can you talk about the DES funding that used to go to CAS? Yes, Mayor. So prior to the one-time homeless solutions, uh, I'm sorry, the homeless shelter and services fund that was targeted to serve the unsheltered, there was $2.5 million from the state that would go to DES matched by about $4 million in federal dollars. For the last six years, I've lobbied to try to get that increased. Um, there was the $60 million last year, but I don't know if there's going to be any more homeless fund whatsoever at the state. So we're setting up some meetings with DES and the governor's office to find out. We formerly would get about 1.5 from that fund, and last year that fund was not available. So we would have normally applied, and we've been getting it for a decade or more. Um, so we are watching carefully and, of course, lobbying to see that there is ongoing state money for homelessness. We're a little worried because we don't know what the scenario looks like for next year. And there's housing money, which is wonderful, but our focus has really been the homeless shelter dollars. So as we find out, we will share with you, but that led to where we're at and then not getting it from the homeless shelter fund was the other piece. Thank you. So at the same time, the, the state is moving forward with a $90 million cut to city revenues, but there are the new costs for us that they used to once cover. We'll go to Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. I, I, I think so often we focus on what CAS does in the downtown area. We forget about the family center in Sunny Slope. And they really do uh, a great job. And I, I have met, I've been there a few times, and I have met some of the residents. I've talked to some of the kids. They range from newborn to teenagers. And I will tell you, they're not all from Phoenix. So I think we need to make sure we're letting other cities and towns know that we're trying to find solutions for the entire region, and we sure would love to have them partner more with us. I'd be more than happy to take council members from other cities and towns and let them tour um, the family shelter, because they do good work. And it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking to see those kids and what they're going through and their parents trying to help them. So I, I, you know, you're in a tough situation. We're all in a tough situation, but whatever I can do, I am committed to trying to show the other jurisdictions in our region that we're, I still feeling that we carry the load. And it's time for other cities and towns to step up. If you don't want the shelters in your jurisdiction, then help us. Because I am very grateful for what they're doing in Sunny Slope. I really am. And you do a great job. Very quiet, very unassuming, but you're there and you're doing great work. Thank you, Mayor. 
Thank you. We'll go to Councilwoman Pastor and then Councilwoman O'Brien. And Thank then Councilman you. Robinson. Thank you. Um, I feel like this conversation every time we meet is just we keep moving round and round and round and uh, provide um, many, some solutions. I guess my question to you is what do you need from us other than money? What do you need from us in order to help to be able then to move other cities ahead? Because after our conversation, I think continuum of care of where all everybody meets there's a whole group that meets and i don't know what happens in this big group but usually in these big groups it's like we're doing this we're doing that what, whatever i would like to uh be part of a conversation where we're leading and getting maybe some of the other big cities together to say we need to write an iga i don't know if it's with mag or who it is an iga that comes about that each city is, is going to put this much uh, money allocation towards uh, CAS and the human services area to be able to provide what is needed in order to get those off, uh, to be, be able to get them sheltered. Um, in particular, there is a shortfall. We will lose services. I'm one of those, and you guys look at me all the time, where I'm like, maybe we need to lose the services in order for people to hear us. Uh, we will then be in that crisis more mode and chaos. However, if that's the way people hear us then, and help, then maybe that's what's needed. I don't know. What I do know is that we need assistance. I do know that we need additional uh, case managers in order for them to be cased and moved into the areas that they need to go to, I mean into housing, not areas, and transitional and, and everything else. However, I can't do that alone. Our, my colleagues from here can't do it alone. We have to do it as a collective and we have to do it as a, a bigger body of cities coming together. So I would like to see that conversation happen. I would like to see that conversation moving and be able then to really within a matter of three months, six months, really push like we did in COVID uh, to get an IGA and moving. We're in crisis. So uh, I, I, those are my comments. I so. think both Philip and I would love to respond. Philip? Yeah, yeah. First and foremost, uh, Cass is in spirit of collaboration every single day. So we welcome the opportunity to join forces with cities, municipalities, as well as other providers to think about best practices, as well as things such as data sharing practices, um, as well as shared resources, especially on the campus. We certainly have a lot of providers and we have a redundancy of efforts sometimes um, that we're all aware of. And so we should be working collaboratively to solve those issues, which would also reduce the total cost of providing services uh, across the continuum. So. We, we certainly are in favor of anything in the collaborative space. Outside of other financial resources, I think getting um, also the entire state to be on one page um, and understanding data, um, how we share data across the continuum of the state would also be highly advantageous because we have such a transient population that oftentimes we'll move north during the summertime and then south during the winter time. Um, and we're not able to track those individuals throughout even the entirety of the state, which then negatively affects our ability to serve people in the truest form. Can I add one thing? There's a tremendous leader running MAG, Ed Zerker, who you all know, and maybe he would pull together a summit on this. I know how committed he is to city solutions and um, starting to build a plan together for the region. I think that would be wonderful. We'd participate. There is a state plan being worked on by the Hobbs administration, but um, all politics are kind of local, all government's kind of local. I mean, I, it's not going to get done as fast that way, so I think some sort of a summit would be something we would love to contribute to. Councilwoman O'Brien. Thank you, Mayor, and I do um, appreciate you all coming and, and sharing your information and, and having that, the data and the numbers uh, with all the council members. Uh, I want to thank our city manager and assistant city manager as well as our budget director for how fastidious you all are in ensuring we're on the right path. 
Having said that, we all know, as some of the other council members said, we're coming up on a cliff where $1 money is going away and, and is not available for ongoing operations. So Mayor, I request that we have a, a policy session where we can talk about, um, I know we'll be having many meetings about our budget, but I think it's not just enough to hear those numbers. It's time for us to talk about this cliff that's coming related to that. And, and if policy is important place, I think, for us to do that, Mayor. So thank you. Thank you, we will schedule that and we also have an upcoming session related to heat and there's many overlapping issues with this topic. Councilman Robinson. Mayor, thank you very much. <clears throat> you know, the questions I had have pretty much been answered, but Lisa, Bill, and Philip, thank you for being here. And I, I will make a comment because Lisa said a couple of times about how lean they are. You know, I can speak with firsthand knowledge going back to the late 80s when as a walking beat sergeant, I had functional supervision around the shelter from five o'clock at night until three o'clock in the morning. So I understand what it takes to run that organization. It was a lot smaller then, or the population was smaller, and it's, it's grown. It's grown tremendously over the years. So I think there's a special place in heaven for all of you guys that work down there, and I truly believe that. I will endeavor, it sounds like, along with my colleagues, to do what we can to help you make up that windfall. Obviously, we're gonna to have to think outside of the box. We have a policy session coming up, but I just wanted um, you folks to know that it, clearly we're appreciative of your work. We understand the predicament you're in. We know how we got there. And you know, I think the right thing to do would be to endeavor to the best of our abilities to help you try to make up that windfall, do what we can to help you move forward because the work that you're doing is tremendous. I just want to thank you for it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, and good recognition. Thank you all. Uh, particularly wanted to recognize the board president, Bill Moreland, who does this as a volunteer, although I'm not clear if you've had any time this week to do your paid job. So thank you all for your, your service. With that, we will go to public comment, and we have Diane Barker. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Diane Barker, I'm in District 7. I support this item, $170,000 to add, I guess, to make up for the inflation for that $5 million budget, which you have millions of dollars that I understand have not been spent for the homeless, uh, which you have identified within the last I'd say three years around this COVID time, but Mayor, you know, Phoenix has had this situation for years, years before you're sitting in this seat. And we always will because we're the biggest bully on the block, okay? I mean, so to speak, we probably have more homeless and lower income in Phoenix. Now, that doesn't mean that it's bad. It means we have a situation, to me, it represents America, the different levels in my lifetime. I want to see Hamburg flippers move up in the middle class or Elon Musk go to the very top. But what we need is we need a basic housing. We need that more than our God-given cars that people, you know, this is, we're a car society. The situation, and I want to pinpoint this today, I'd like to see Mayor Gallego call up Ed Zerker. Yeah, he knows about this, and Mayor, I've been over at MAG, we have pathways, it's integrated, they have an oral whole organization chart way back before even Stanton got involved with the veterans and helped them off of the street, MAG has that. The, the city started helping Phoenix with the homeless, but that call needs to be made today because we need action on this. And we know Ed has admitted when they were fixing the street on Van Buren that you put the affordable housing on they deferred it five times. This has to stop. You need to start doing now, and I've seen some movement in this city in the right direction. Thank you, Diane. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Waring. Stark. 
Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. All right. From talking about millions of dollars, we go to a smaller item, uh, 7,000 for three years for the Global Chamber. Do we have a motion? I will move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Leslie Shepard. So this three-year membership with the Global Chamber, just the name of it, Global, should be concerning. This global issue So the 17K for three years for a total of two, uh, um, 21,000 to sell the city of Phoenix out to the globalists. The Global Chamber has 12,000 members worldwide and the city of Phoenix joined in 2019 when it was Mayor Gallego's first year in being mayor. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor. Since joining the Global Chamber, the City of Phoenix has implemented many ESGs and DEI policies that have led to skyrocketing homelessness, increased heat due to bunching everything into high density and adding heat island effects, increased particulate pop uh, pollution, and com uh, completely out of touch policy machine that wants to reduce meat consumption, take people out of their cars and make them ride bikes. When I hear people telling we got to get rid of cars, it's a joke. It's a joke. If you're a single mom and you're being told you need to give up your car so that you can ride a bike or take a, a bus, that is more popular in this, in this state than we realize the single parents involved. So even the fact that that's even involved here, it just blows my mind. And God bless my little friend over here who loves, you know, ma uh, the public transit. I'm not down on transit, but don't make us give up our vehicles and create 15-minute cities, which c becomes a problem for us. That's selling us out. Um, uh, so the main thing is, I hear a lot of bunny. I heard, you know, you said, what can we do about the homeless? Thank wow, you. just think if we can. I am looking forward to support this item. The Global Chamber have been great partners with us. They're helping us with our semiconductor ecosystem. They've helped us locate several companies, including ZoroSign to, and uh, PayPro to Phoenix and, and growing jobs in our economy. Any additional comments? Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 47, will the clerk read the title? Item 47 is for Ordinance G7221, an ordinance amending Chapter 4 of the Phoenix City Code enacting a peer-to-peer -peer vehicle sharing program to be codified as Article 4, Section 4-87 of Chapter 4 of the Phoenix City Code and to revise Sections 4-1, 4-190, and 4-192 pertaining to commercial use permits in Chapter 4 of the Phoenix City Code. Vice Mayor. Mayor, I move to approve Item 47. We have a motion and a second from Councilwoman Pastor. So this is an item that amends the existing ordinance that allows rideshare companies like Lyft and Uber and then brings in uh, a more formal program for companies such as Turo. Leslie. I appreciate how you said my name. I can tell I irritate you a little bit, that's okay. Okay, so this um, number 47, that's where we're at, right? Yeah. Um, this policy is inequitable for folks trying to get by and provide ride share services to Sky uh, Harbor Airport. It nev negatively impacts the poor because it adds another tax on ride sharing. If the driver can afford to pay the tax, then it will be passed down to the customer who will then wind up paying even more for the service. This is another example of the city pushing corrupt policies that benefit a different set of companies 
than the ones negatively, negatively impacted. When you put a tree in, I was appreciating the little lady at the end there. I, I can't tell her district. Um, when you guys tell a story to make it okay with what you're doing, it doesn't make it okay. It makes it okay for you to think that it's okay. Please like keep your you, testimony to item 47. Well, it still comes down to your choices that you make regarding us and the choices that affect us and how you justify it after You've already made the motion, you've already seconded the motion, then you call me up to do the niceties. So the bottom line is this, people are homeless. They're not that far from here. I see a lot of action being taken right now for things that are not that big of a deal. Trees are nice, and yes, people can go out and have fun and take walks and take their dogs out, whether they plant a tree that day or not. But we have homeless on Madison that is growing, and it's growing and it's growing. And if it bothers you that I get off the subject because I'm going to keep bringing it to your attention, I'm okay about bothering you. Have a good day. We have public comment at the end of the meeting, which you can cop about any topic you want. This is about item 47. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Waring. Stark. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 48 is airport custodial and floor care services contract. We have a motion. Mayor, I move to approve item 48. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have Oliver here to testify in opposition. And then we will go for virtual public comment to Carl. Afternoon, council member. And ladies Sir, could you move the microphone a little bit closer to you? My apology. You. Good afternoon, council member, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, my name is Oliver Ebay. I am the president and CEO of Biogenitorial, the company that's currently supporting janitorial surveys for the small. Uh, Group B Airport Custodial Services. If I am here to object and also object and protect the award to 3H and their Samiro, I do have a thick accent. If anyone doesn't understand me, I'd be more than glad to repeat myself. I will not be bashful, please. It's very important. The award or the criteria for selection, they have a, a, a criteria set forth. 3H plagiarized on my document that I submitted to City of Phoenix, aviation to be specific. They literally copy and paste and put a lot of lipstick on some document. I do have all that with me. Here, here is 3H Samiro. They have at least 20 of my documents on my proposal submitted to the aviation to get the high score they have right now. And yet, I was not recognized enough for the fact that I'm currently providing the service. On page, eight, page 38 of their Samiro is my document of pages 26 and 27. And on, they also plagiarized on my document, page 27, 57, and 58. I am just simply asking the council, no, that award cannot happen. Let them go back and revisit the evaluation. I know I don't have a lot of time here. I have 20 pages that verbatim everything. And I wrote a letter to the council. I don't know if they received it. And that letter was shared with aviation. If you want to, I can pass on those documents. 
on page 46, 28 of my document. Thank you, sir. Unfortunately, the time is up. So we, um, unless council members have questions, you wanna? Okay, um, sir, would you pause for a moment? Councilwoman Pastor would like to ask you a question. Of this case, that is not. Sir. Sir, would you accept a question? Could you pause and, and I think Councilman Pastor. Sir, when um, you got the notice, or I'm, I'm not sure, I think I need airport up here, um, or aviation. Um, there is a moment when a, there is an award to a RFP. And during that time, there is a time period to protest as to what you're saying. Did you protest during that time? During period? that time. Yes, I, I did. I don't know what time you're referring to, but when I saw the score evaluation, that is when I contacted the aviation and made them aware of what happened. Literally everything they have there is my document. Okay. And I have it here with me. So I guess my next question is, how did you notify the department that you were protesting? I wrote them a letter and I made a phone call and that letter was also addressed to the council members. I don't know if they received it or they sent it to you. Okay. I would like aviation to uh, please walk through once a RFP has been awarded and what the protest period is and what, how do you notify? Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Member Pastor. So in this particular process, the awards were posted on October 23rd. Uh, that posting to the website uh, triggers the protest period. It's a seven day protest period per city procurement policy uh, and that expired on October 31st. And uh, at that point we had received no protests whatsoever from any of the protesters or any of the applicants, I should say, or proposers. We did not hear uh, from uh, Mr. Ebay until I think the first communication was in December of, of 2023 where he asked for some additional information to include some of the proposals in the procurement packet. And after that, we did not hear from him until February, I think it was February 1st or February 2nd, uh, where he indicated he wished to protest the process. Can I ask one more question? Other than putting it on the website, how else do you notify uh, applicants as to the process. Is there a letter mailed? Is there a certified letter mail? Is there an email, a text? Because I think it's really sometimes hard uh, when we put we we use the fact that we put it on our website or, or I hear that all the time. Uh, it's, our website's very difficult to get on and unless you know the system very well, it's just hard. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Member uh, Pastor. That is uh, true, and in, in the City um, Finance Procurement Code, it, it, it basically explains how we go about this process. And in this process, we included information to all the proposers as a part of the RFP to expect the, we created a scheduled timeline of when we expected all these actions to take place. Uh, we did not specifically notify the proposers via email uh, because that's not uh, a part of the procurement policy. So we do tell in the pre-proposal meeting all proposers that they need to monitor that website so when the proposals are posted, the awards are posted, uh, that the uh, appeals process or protest process is in place. Could I ask a question Councilman to that Brian. point? Thank you, Mayor. So when you have the, um, I'm sorry, you just the, like, the pre-meeting before everybody uh, sends in their proposals, right, the, to the informational meeting. You provide, is it at that time you provide a list of dates of when things are going to occur? Uh, Mayor and Council Member O'Brien, yeah, so in the pre-proposal meeting where we bring all the uh, potential interested parties in, we do talk about the timeline in a presentation at that meeting, and in the RFP itself, or the proposal itself, all of those dates are listed in the proposal. And so the date for announcing the um, winners, is that a, a hard and fast date? Uh, Mayor and uh, Councilmember O'Brien, it's not. We give an approximate time frame for when we think the awards will be posted, and it's based on ultimately the process by which the uh, panel is brought together to do the evaluations uh, and whether or not we need to do any best and final offers 
uh, in accordance with the procurement code. And what's that approximate time frame? In this particular proposal, it was, um, I think I have the dates. I believe we uh, issued the RFP. Awards were due in August. I want to say August 4th. And then October 23rd is when we posted the award. Um, so, I guess, so do you say you can, like, any time in this week? Or is it, they, I mean, they, if I submit it on August 4th, you're not going to have an answer or a, an award out by the end of that week. You, you know that it takes you approximate amount of time. So do you give me a window to say from October 1st to October 30th I need to look? Or what's that kind of time frame is what I'm trying to understand? Mayor and Council Member O'Brien, I don't know the exact date that was identified, um, but it's, it's an approximate time frame when we think the awards will be posted. Okay. Um, thank you. I might have more questions, Mayor, after we hear Wonderful. from the speakers. We have, um, the, we have two speakers online who are with the successful company, but first we'll go to Councilwoman Hunt Washington. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to understand, so some of my questions have already been answered by my colleagues. Um, to follow up on Councilman O'Brien's question, when we talk about the time frame that the, uh, the potential applicants will be submitted, what is the range that we give them for the time frame? Is it, because let me, let me give some background on my question. If we're saying we give them a range that will be in a space of seven days or 10 days where you'll get the, when the award will be made and you have seven days to then appeal it, I'm just trying to understand is there sufficient time frame, time in between I feel like I'm not being very clear. But say, for example, we tell them from February 1st to February 14 is when, that, um, when the award will be issued, right? And then we say you have seven days to appeal or to protest it. Does that, set, that seven days starts from when it's actually posted? Uh, Mayor and Council Member Hodge Washington, the seven days does start from the date of posting. Uh, so in this instance, we posted on um, October 23rd. The protest period started that date, mm -hmm. and then it expired on October 31st. And then what was the time period, the time frame that we gave the, um, those that were interested in submitting proposals when the award would actually be issued? So that, that uh, Mayor Council Member Hodge Washington, I don't have that specific uh, date um, with me, and so I would not, I, I could uh, follow up with you on the exact date or what date was, was posted. Uh, but what's in, important uh, in accordance with the city uh, procurement code, as I understand it, is that it is the responsibility of each proposer uh, to monitor the website and to ensure that they are um, aware of when these postings happen. They also are encouraged to communicate with our procurement officer with any questions as it relates to time frame or if there are any delays uh, so that the procurement officer can make sure that they have current information and can uh, properly protest if they choose to. Okay. Um, is there an, other than the protest period that is provided, uh, the seven day protest period, is there another mechanism for which an uh, applicant can request reconsideration? Mayor and uh, Council Member Hodge Washington, the appeals period per the procurement code is their opportunity and it's their sole opportunity to formally protest the process. However, they can uh, choose to avail themselves to public meetings and in this instance we um, presented the custodial award to our business and development subcommittee of our Phoenix Aviation Board to our full Phoenix Aviation Board, and to our uh, City Council Transportation Infrastructure and Planning Subcommittee. And there were no uh, comments uh, presented or protests or appeals uh, at any of those meetings. And then my last question will be, I'm not suggesting um, that the current award, or the proposed awardee has con um, made actually made, made misrepresentation or misstatements but as the speaker mentioned is um indicated that there was some level of uh, i think was plagiarism is the word that he used is there any evaluation or any consequences how does what is the city's recourse if that is found to be correct uh, mayor council member hodge washington if that were brought up during the formal protest period we would seek uh, guidance from our legal counsel as to whether or not that um, particular issue had merit uh, that would result in a disqualification of a proposal, and we would have made the decision at that time. Thank you. you uh, Councilman O'Brien. Thank you, Mayor. Are winning proposals posted online? 
Mayor, Council Member O'Brien, uh, they are not posted online. However, they are a part of the procurement file, and any proposer at the time of award can request that procurement file, which contains all of the proposals, including the winning proposal. And do we, I, I shouldn't say this, but, um, when you, because this is re a repeat contract in the sense that we're always going to need custodial services at the airport, that's not going to change. So when you have a, does your rubric ever change or, and does that rubric get, is that part of the information process for, um, for these folks who bid? Mayor, uh, Council Member O'Brien, um, generally the RFP structure doesn't change. It's very similar and the content is very similar. What does change, however, is we add facilities over time. So the scope of the facilities that they use, or in this instance, we broke apart the contract into two separate, uh, for the large contractors, into two separate contracts. Uh, so the scope can change in that regard. However, um, the process under the procurement code doesn't change. Of course, and I just want to, um go back to the point that Councilwoman Hodge Washington hit on. So what you said was that at, you presented at November 2nd to the Business and Development Subcommittee. Um, you presented to the Phoenix Aviation Advisory Board. I'm just reading from the, the packet, thank you. And the Transportation and Infrastructure and Planning Subcommittee um, and on January 31st. And you had not heard anything up and through January 31st? Mayor, Councilmember O'Brien, that's correct. Thank you again, Mayor. Thank you. Any additional comments before we go to our, okay, we will now go to, um, and I guess Oliver, if you, you wanna sit, we, uh, if council members have questions, they will, they will ask you to come back up. Um, we'll go next to Carl, followed by OJ. You guys hear me okay? Okay, yes. Uh, Carl, we could, I, it was not amazingly clear, but we could hear you. Could you provide your testimony? Carl? Can you hear me okay? That's much better. All right. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll start over. Mayor and City Council member, I thank you for this opportunity. But in this line of business, the janitorial business, when you have multiple vendors bidding on a certain jobs, you're going to find a lot of the information is the same because we all there trying to give you the best information we can to prove to you that we are the best vendor to take care to service your facilities. So in that respect, I don't understand where he's coming from, but yes, throughout, throughout the uh, history of, of this business, a lot of information will look the same. Okay. Um, pretty much that's all I have. Okay. Thank you for that testimony. Our final speaker oh, no, uh, will be OJ. Well, can you guys, uh, can you um, hear me okay? We can. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for this time and opportunity to speak on behalf of the organization. Um, as Mr. Mack has mentioned, again, um, with this industry, there is gonna be a lot of similarities as we all are aiming for the same, which is providing a clean, facility for our customers, which in this case is the Phoenix Airport. Um, so yes, a lot of the information may seem similar, but at the end, of, but with structured or it, sorry, I got, I got cut off a little in the middle. I'm sorry about that. But um, yes, my testimony is just similar to Mr. Max with regards to um, the information, similar information within this industry. Okay, thank you for that testimony. Any additional comments or questions? Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado? Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. All right, item 62 is. Intelligent Transportation System Devices. Do we have a motion? I move to approve item 62. Second. We have a motion and a second. This item was removed for, from consent for testimony from Leslie Shepard. Leslie. All right, Leslie is not here. Looking forward to supporting this item. This will help us use technology to address challenges we face, such as red light running and more. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado? 
Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. Next we go to item 77. Uh, item 77 is approval of the Phil Gordon Threatened Building Grant for the Sergeant Oldacre House. Do we have a motion? So moved. I'll move to approve. That you might. It was in your district. <laughs> Second. <laughs> we have a motion from Councilwoman Pastor, who has the largest amount of historic preservation properties, and a second from Councilwoman Ansari, whose district is home to this exciting property. Um, this is a, an exciting grant award for us. This is the first time we have awarded funding through, from the Threatened Building Grant Program since we named it to honor Phil Gordon. Um, was very excited that the historic, uh, to work with the Historic Preservation Council to commission to name the Threatened Building Grant Program and the Warehouse Protection Program in honor of Phil Gordon. Phil Gordon has a, a deep history on these issues before Mayor Gordon was mayor. He was a young developer and he worked very hard on rehabbing historic buildings in the Roosevelt District to spur commercial adaptive reuse projects. In 1986, he filed the application to list the first historic property on the Phoenix Historic Property Register, which was the Corpstein Duplex on Roosevelt. Uh, Phil Gordon sat on our Phoenix Planning Commission and then was elected to the Phoenix City Council in 1997. He then successfully ran for Phoenix mayor and served from 2004 to 2012. During his tenure as mayor, four additional neighborhoods were designated as historic. Mayor Gordon has had a very lasting impact on historic preservation in Phoenix, and I'm excited to vote for this as well as future programs future buildings that we will protect thanks to the program that now bears his name. Any additional comments? Councilwoman Pastor. Yes, I just want to thank the community in doing, um, naming the Phil Gordon or the Historic Preservation. Um, but most importantly, I want to thank Phil for understanding and wanting to preserve our history in Phoenix. Um, there were others that wanted to do it, but he really took the took the lead and uh, put his money where his mouth is and, and and entered and uh, basically said we're going to preserve these areas. Uh, we would not have our historic districts if it hadn't been for Phil Gordon really pushing and leading in that space. And so uh, I happen to represent, I think, 85 plus historic districts. I think maybe one or two are out of the out of my area, but. Um, I'm just very proud that we're doing this and that we are preserving history. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you, Mayor. I will just echo those sentiments. Um, very supportive of this item. And um, on, a, on the note about Phil Gordon, I um, actually recently toured the Madison School District and saw his photos on the wall and didn't know he was on the school board there far before he ran for, for council, too. So he has obviously a very long history in Phoenix. And this is, um, and on top of that, is just a very kind, funny person. I also want to thank uh, Helena Rudder and everyone at the Historic Preservation Office, CED, and planning for helping us land such a huge win for the community. I'm so excited that we will be restoring this 1909 home and breathing new life into it as a restaurant. Um, from Sotis to Savage, we have some amazing examples in our downtown core of the atmosphere that can be created when we choose to preserve old funky buildings. So this is another great example of that. Thank you. And it's worth recognizing this particular building had many mayors involved with it. So Mayor Terry, former Mayor Terry Gorder was all, Gor, former. Oh, good. I married them. That's, oh. <laughs> we got to get this meeting over. Uh, Terry Goddard uh, helped uh, fight for this particular building and then the solution that we came up with. Um, and we've had many great former mayors who are passionate about historic preservation and many other topics. And we will continue looking for ways to recognize and celebrate their contributions as well. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Waring. Yes. Stark. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0.
We next go to item 78, which is a case at the southwest corner of 19th Avenue and Quail Avenue in District 1. I will turn to Councilwoman O'Brien. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I just want to say how excited um, I am to have Tesla have their second location in Phoenix in the heart of the Deer Valley area. Uh, we have had five continuances and it's been over four months since this was first on a city council agenda. Um, I want to thank all of those who were diligent and hardworking in getting over the barriers and making this uh, happen. So thank you all to, who did that. And like I said, we're just so excited to have them be in district one. Wonderful, thank you. We have Mr. Fishbach here to testify and Mr. Smith available to testify if necessary. Hearing that, <laughs> excellent. Roll call. Ansari. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Waring. Stark. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. Congratulations. There was a lot of work to get to this moment. <laughs> <laughs> And item 88 is in District 4 at the northeast corner of 3rd Street and Cherry Lane Road. Cherry Lane Road. Uh, it's in Councilman Pastor's district. Did you want to say anything before we open the public hearing? Just open up the public hearing and then I'll move. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have opened the public hearing. We have several speakers available to speak if necessary, but uh, why don't we begin with the motion? All right, here I go. Uh, motion to approve Z-50-23-4 per the Planning Commission's recommendation with an additional stipulation as follow. Nine, the building elevation shall contain architectural embellishments and detailing such as the textural changes, uh, offsets, recesses, variation in window size and location, and or overhang canopies and artistic mural as approved by the Planning and Development Department and adopt the related ordinance. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have the applicant, legal counsel, and Tom Frankel here to testify, all marked to speak if necessary. Hearing that, uh, please, <laughs> we're good. All right. We will close the public hearing. Thank you for, again, this is another one a lot of work went into to get us to where we are today. Roll call. Ansari. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Hodge Washington. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Waring. Yes. Stark. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. So thank you for staying. It passed. Items 89 and 90 are related to the public hearing of 78th Avenue, southwest corner of 78th Avenue and Alta Vista Road. We will have one hearing but two votes. Uh, it is in D District 7. We will open the public hearing. We have uh, Tom... We do not have any speakers. No, we have Jennifer Hall here to speak. Uh, Jennifer, any questions for Jennifer? Close the public hearing. Uh, Councilman Ansari, do you have a motion first on item 89? Yes, motion to approve the item per the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the related resolution. Second. Any comments? Roll call. Ansari? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 90. Motion to approve the item per the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Roll call. Ansari? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Waring? Yes. Stark? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. That concludes the agendized portion of today's meeting. We'll next go to the final portion, which is 
public comment, and I'll turn to our city attorney to explain this portion. Thank you, Mayor. During citizen comment, members of the public may address the City Council for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. The citizen comment session is limited to 30 minutes. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the City Council to listen to the comments but prohibits Council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you. We'll begin with Diane Barker. Thank you, Baron City Council, Diane Barker, in District 7. And our speaker, Leslie, left, but, you know, I talked to her a little bit, and I just said, hey, I just have a counterpoint, but she's kind of characterizing me as somebody that wants to get people out of their car, and I think that that's really crazy, because, you know, I told her, I says, well, why? I couldn't get a seat on the bus. But no, the thing about it, it's not that I am lobbying for the bus or anything. I'm actually interested in a balance of transportation, and I saw this. You know, I had years in real estate and, you know, had supported, uh, I think, six cars and so forth. They said, get a nice car, take your client out. I found out most people wanted to arrive at the property in their own car. Now, today, we can do real estate on the internet, you don't necessarily see it. I just see the imbalances, I see values outside of riding around all the time in your car, and that's part of the reason why I do speak on the subject. I'm not here to lobby for the bus system. Matter of fact, I've even had people in the past say, Diane Barker said, we need more buses. And you know, I never said that. And so I correct them on that. So I just like to establish that. You know, I see the value not only in building affordable housing, but also the education for people to be able to use that attribute and that step up and near a public transit. I was able to go to the Northwest Extension. It's the first time I've seen us build above the ground on rail. It seemed to work. I'd like to see more of integrated planning at that Ottawa stop there on the rail. I looked out and I saw that land and everything. I talked to Howard Stern some at some length about this and they said the city has some planning. I want to get involved in that planning. I see that around Metro Center, Thelda Williams, you know, plan something where they would renovate that. First time I went to Castles and Coasters, I could see people getting on rail, going up, staying at the Doubletree Hotel, by the way, which I was put out on a public announced event. I got an apology by Mario and over at Valley Metro, but I don't want to have to be at a place where people are going to disregard what I have to say. I said I saw a public announcement and Valley Metro saying, no, you didn't. We need to have our council, not only in transportation, but every single thing we do in the city, oversee our contractors and agents. I've read contracts and they say these agents need to follow all the laws, including public input. Thank you. Christina will be next, followed by Roland. Hello, so the first thing that I wanted to say was thank you for the police officers for um, doing a true investigation, which is what I had requested um, the last meeting for that to be done. So I wanna start off by saying thank you for that. Um, but I am here today to uh, talk about a different matter. Uh, I used to be a former collegiate softball player. I lettered in five different sports in high school within the state. And I also, after I graduated, I coached, I umpired, and I instructed. Um, one of the issues that I wanted to start addressing, and it's not just an issue within this city, it's also in other cities and in other states, um, is the inequities that is happening being a female umpire, let alone one who played college softball. And so um, 
Basically, what is currently happening is that we allow umpires as young as 13 years old to start umpiring. In a lot of our city fields, we only have one changing room and no, there is not uh, changing stalls. So there is an, an, an imbalance of female to male umpires, let alone for young girls. Picture a 13-year-old girl and trying to convince a 13-year-old girl why it is uh, appropriate for her to have to change in front of a 70-year-old man. The thing is, and on top of that, when it comes to the sports, we don't have unofficial rules. So the thing is, is that when it comes to how a person is allowed to act, behave, I was trained when I played to break girls' legs, to break their fingers if they were doing things that was inappropriate or wrong or to hurt my teammates. And it was a game of hurt, 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 hurt. And so I would like the different cities to start enacting unofficial rules, rules that are not uh, considered part of a sport and part of a game. I would also like to request for the city to uh, start to budget to have equal facilities when it comes to changing rooms so that way females are not being told that are 13 years old to go change in a parking lot at, in a bad part of town or to go change in a bathroom. That is not appropriate. That is not okay. We need more females to start umpiring. When I umpired in the AIA, the average age was 81 years old. 81. You guys should be concerned and you guys should, should start funding equal changing rooms and that would be a start to equality in the sport. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see if our team can follow up on that item. Uh, Roland is next, followed by Rafilwe. I'd like to say that my name is Roland Harris. Um, I'm here today to present a citizen petition pursuant in uh, chapter four, section 22 of the Phoenix City Chatter. I, Roland Harris, citizen and resident of the city of Phoenix, hereby petition the city council to enact a resolution calling on the Department of Justice to publicly release its full investigatory report of the City of Phoenix and the City of Phoenix Police Department. As soon as such as investigation and requests are complete and final, the investigatory report release should include the totality of the Department of Justice's findings against the City of Phoenix and the City of Phoenix Police Department, as well as all factual basis for the findings and should not be mere summary of the department's findings. Whereas the Phoenix Police Department under the leadership of Mayor Gallego and the council has become a deadless police force in the country and engages in a pattern of and practices of using unconstitutional excessive force, including deadly force against Phoenix, city of Phoenix residents, particularly residents of color, such as my son, Jacob Michael Harris. Whereas the Phoenix Police Department under the leadership of Mayor Gallego and Council regularly engages in a pattern of practices of discriminatory policing against Phoenix residents of color, Phoenix residents with disabilities, and Phoenix's unsheltered population. Whereas the Phoenix Police Department under the leadership of Mayor Gallego and Council regularly engage in a pattern of practices of retaliatory policing against individuals who are and who are perceived to be expressing viewpoints critical of the police. This includes a pattern of practices of using excessive force against actual and perceived anti-police demonstrators in the form of tear gas, pepper spray, pepper balls, and other kinetic <coughs> mutations, as well as pattern of practices of maliciously prosecuting innocent demonstrators to silence the immediate and intimidate them. This includes making up a fictional criminal street gang, fabricating evidence and lying about the 
factual basis for false charges, whereas the Phoenix Police Department, under the leadership of Mayor Gallego and Council, regularly engaged in pattern and practices of using excessive force against children, particularly children of color. Whereas the Phoenix Police Department, under the leadership of Mayor Gallego and Council, regularly engages in pattern and practices of unlawful harassing a Phoenix's unsheltered population. Whereas the Phoenix Police Department, under the leadership of Mayor Gallego, and the City Council regularly engages in a pattern of practices of unlawful seizing of personal property of the unsheltered population of Phoenix. Our final speaker will be Rafilway. I'm here in support and solidarity with the Justice for Jacob Harris, Free the Phoenix Three Coalition, as well as all of the families in the Family Justice Coalition and Collective, everyone who's been impacted by state violence in the uh, state of Arizona and then within the city of Phoenix. We're calling for transparency and accountability. The people of Phoenix have the right to see what the investigation findings are and the accountability from you all to ensure that they see that. Thank you. Thank you, we are adjourned. or even shin guards and skateboards, all right here at Goodwill's Retail Operations Center in District 7. That's truly, truly incredible. There's no doubt that plastic pollution is an enormous problem, not only here in Phoenix, but worldwide. We see plastic waste on our streets, in our waterways, and islands of plastic the size of Arizona in our oceans. It clogs our landfills with materials that will virtually never break down. And it's a problem that is very difficult to combat. Current recycling processes and solutions are large and very capital intensive, relying on widespread waste collection networks. And lack of guaranteed supply prevents investment and business attraction, and there are currently very few intermediate or end market producers here in the state of Arizona. At this 10,000 square foot facility, plastic waste presents an opportunity that will improve public well being through entrepreneurship while also preventing valuable commodities from ending up in our landfill. Again, this is a huge, huge deal, not only for Phoenix, but hopefully one day the world. I'm so excited for our future. Phoenix is and will continue to be a leader in circular economy solutions, and I'm even more motivated to see our universities and local businesses, companies, residents engaged in these efforts. Um, over the coming year or two, we will be updating our climate action plan. We have a transportation electrification action plan. There's so much work that's going on at the city to make sure that we truly achieve the vision of being the most sustainable desert city in the world. So thank you to all for being a huge part of that. Thank you so much.